I have cousins in Tennessee, for example, who would come over and tell me about their experiences. Like, it's it's really crazy how different it is from the DMV. Um, they've told me about, like, racist experiences they've had. Um, it, it'll just be, like, blunt racist experiences. And then they'll also tell me about how they don't see any Ethiopian people. Um, but, you know, their parents make the effort to sort of keep them in touch with their culture and their roots. And I think that um, for for people who are di diaspora you have to really make that effort to stay in touch with your roots because it's really easy to lose um your connections to your past and i don't think people realize how important it is um so i feel like moving forward i will make an effort to sort of get in touch with my culture She's my woman, Salam and hello everyone. My name is Lily Bakala Piper and thank you so much for tuning in today. So as you know, this show is about stories of joy and justice from Africa and the diaspora. And today I am so glad that I get to talk to some young people in the diaspora about what it's like for them in this moment in time. Today on the show, I have three young people, two Ethiopian and one Eritrean student from Blair High School in Silver Springs, Maryland. Yes, Silver Springs. Those of you who are from the Ethiopian and Eritrean diaspora probably know Silver Springs. It is a hugely popular area and destination for those of us from this part of the world and has the highest density of Ethiopian and Eritreans in North America. You cannot walk down the street in Silver Spring without seeing another person from the Horn of Africa, without smelling babare in the air, without being greeted with a head nod and a salam. It's actually quite a comforting and warm place to be in. And every summer, my family finds ourselves there visiting family and friends and cousins and, and all that. Well, my dear friend Marta is a teacher at Blair High School. And over the last few years, she's been telling me about the young people that she teaches there their immense talent, their opportunities there, the way that they're finding their identity and navigating culture as young people in the diaspora and also very deeply rooted to their identities back here at home, back here being East Africa. In fact, Marta is the advisor for a group called We the East. We the East is a collection of students from East Africa who gather to put on cultural events, fundraisers, just to help each other you know, navigate identity. And in the last couple of years, as you can imagine, you know, being a part of that club has come with its own set of challenges, but also a lot of beauty and connection as these young people have developed friendships and found their way to understand who they are in this day and age. Listening to Marta talk about her young people has really resonated with me. When I was a kid, very young, not even two years old, my family immigrated to the United States. But unlike Marta and the students at Blair High School, I never lived in communities where there were many Ethiopians. My family lived in Illinois, North Dakota. Yes, North Dakota, if you can believe it. In Indiana, in Kansas, and eventually South Carolina, where I spent a number of years in middle school and high school. In all of these places, we were always the only Ethiopian family, and that felt very isolating. It was hard not to feel represented or to feel very othered in every space. You know, I had all kinds of weird questions being asked. And, and in particular, I remember going to stores with my mom and people would hear her accent and they would ask, oh, do you speak French? You know, that was the only language that they knew of outside of English that she could possibly speak. You know, when there were cultural days like Kwanzaa, they assumed that we knew what Kwanzaa was. And of course, we did not know what Kwanzaa was. It was a constant feeling of being outside, of not feeling connected to anything around me. And honestly, as a young person, that was disorienting. It was hard. And it really took me years to come to terms with that. Every summer, my family would gather at an Ethiopian conference. And for years, it was held in Chicago, Illinois. It was a gathering of Ethiopian evangelicals. And that place for me was the closest thing that felt like home when I was a part of the diaspora. You know, for one week, my cousins, who were actually my biological cousins, and all of my cousins, who were, you know, in air quotes, cousins, would gather at this conference. Our parents would be in workshops and in sessions all day, and the kids, we would just connect so deeply. And the highlight of these conferences would be if someone got married, because if someone got married at these conferences, 
you know, everyone would bring in injera and wet from wherever they lived, you know, from Chicago or from DC or Minnesota, wherever they were traveling and people would bring in wet, they would bring in all these remnants of home. And if you closed your eyes, it felt like you were back in Addis Ababa or in Gojab or in Marcos or in Harar. It was so beautiful and profound. And as a kid, it just felt like a time to see the people I loved most, the aunties, the uncles, the cousins. But now as I reflect on it as an adult, it really was a time where I felt rooted in my identity, where speaking Amharic was not unusual, but it was the norm, where eating with our hands was just a beautiful part of who we were and not something surprising or unusual. It was really important for my identity and my development. Well, I am just really grateful that Marta has opened up a door for me to talk to some of her young people about what it's like for them in 2023 to be a part of the diaspora, how language and you know culture and all of these things have shaped who they are and how it's still shaping who they are. In this conversation, they talk about how you know they're not there yet all the way with their identity, that they really do value what their parents say and their sacrifices for them that they're still finding connection, that they're still figuring out, you know, how to be fully who they are. They really opened my eyes and softened my heart with all the ways that they are thinking about what it means to be Ethiopian and what it means to be Eritrean and be young and be a part of the diaspora. So I am really glad to bring you this conversation and I hope it invites you to do some reflecting as well about your own path with identity. And in fact, if you're looking for more conversations similar to this, I have a couple of previous episodes around third cultural kids, but specific to the Ethiopian Eritrean conversation, um, episode 16 is with my good friend Mogus, where we talk about what it was like for the Eritrean community when Dr. Abby won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. So if you're looking for some previous episodes, um, check that one out. It was a conversation that I think was really timely and important. But in the meantime, let me just bring you this conversation with Sophia, Daniel, and Mekres, three students from Blair High School, about what it's like to be young and in the diaspora today. Enjoy. So as I said, I am just delighted today to have with us Magnus, Daniel, and Sophia, three students from Blair High School in Silver Springs, Maryland, join me on the show today. I'm just really grateful that they are taking time out to tell us some of their thoughts on being young, being a part of the diaspora, being Ethiopian Eritrean, and what that means to them in 2023 in the different places that they live and move and are figuring out life. So let's just get right to it. Let me ask you each to please introduce yourself. Yourself, maybe tell me your age, uh, you know, where you're from, where you consider home, maybe where you were born and raised. Um, yeah, let's start right there. Magdas, why don't you go first? Okay, my name is Magdas Dixon. I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, but I was raised in Silver Spring, Maryland for the like past 12 years. Yeah. Welcome, Magdas. Um, my name is Daniel Mohari. I'm 18 years old. Uh, I was born in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia as well, but I moved here at the age of four with um, my twin siblings and my parents. And then I've been here for, I've been in Silver Spring for about 14 years or so. Okay. You're becoming a local there, I think, at this yep, point. Yep, yep. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> okay, Sophia? My name's Sophia. I'm 16 and I'm Eritrean, but I was raised in Silver Spring. Okay. And where were you born, Sophia? I was born in Silver Spring. In Silver Springs. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. I am really grateful to have your voices. I think so much of the conversation happening about Ethiopian and Eritrean culture is happening with people my age. And I think we have so much to learn from young people like yourselves. So I met you all through your advisor, Marta Woodward, who's a dear friend of mine and the advisor for the club We the East at your high school, Blair High School. So maybe I could ask Magnus to just start us off by telling us, you know, what is We the East? You know, what is it? You know, why was it formed? And what does this club mean to you? And, and actually, I'd love to hear from all three of you what this club has meant to you. Okay, so We the East is essentially a club for generally mostly East African people, but anybody is welcome to the club we don't exclude anybody and it's just a club where everybody can come together as a community and a lot of the time we don't really have particular activities planned or anything like that it will just be a space where everybody can come and get to know each other and make more friends and I mean we've done fundraiser fundraisers for 
um, orphanages in Ethiopia and Eritrea, and we've done bake sales, and we're working on like this end of the year picnic for everything. So it's just a very collaborative group. And for me, um, I started it last year. And for me, it's just a space to be with the people who are like me. So that's why I like it. Thank you. How about for you, uh, Daniel? What is what is We the East meant to you? Okay, so actually, I'm I'm not part of We the East, but um, I've definitely seen the club from the outside. I've been to a couple of meetings, but I I really do appreciate what they do and their presence at Blair because we don't actually have a lot of East African or even African clubs in general here at Blair. So to see that there's an organization that does that at Blair is pretty amazing because there's a large like. I think the outside of Ethiopia, Washington DC and the DMV area has the largest like Ethiopian population. And um, Blair is very diverse as well. And we have a huge Ethiopian population here. So um, seeing something like that here at Blair is really something I think that's important um, for the community here. And it's important that our people are are represented within the community. Um, they, we've had issues actually before with like, um, our flag being taken down and stuff. And then so um, Miss Woodward and then um, I, I bet some people from We the East were also pretty involved and concerned when it came to that and actually did a lot of stuff with getting the flag back up, I believe. Uh, I'm not too sure, but, you know, it's important to have organizations that speak out and represent our people here at Blair. So absolutely. Yeah. Sophia, how about you? What are your thoughts? Um, we the East means a lot to me because I was there like the first day of school um, or the first meeting um, since we got back from COVID. So, um, and it was towards the beginning of the year. So I didn't know many people and joining the club was just a great way to make a huge community of friends that are, um, that have shared cultures with me and even like was a space where I could learn more about like Ethiopian culture, which is pretty cool. Um, and it was also a space where I could learn like the Eritrean dances and I've learned more Tigrinya from being in We the East because I've made more Eritrean friends. So it's just meant a lot to me in regards to like connecting with my culture more. Um, and um, since a lot of like discussions regarding like politics and um, uh, the Horn of Africa are usually like dictated by like older people, um, there can be like a lot of like tension like regarding like those types of conversations. So having a club like this, like um, where students like of different backgrounds can like coexist like peacefully and like just enjoy each other's company is really important to have at Blair. Yeah, that you've said so much in that. That's a really powerful statement. So let's let's talk about that first. You know, the last few years have not been easy for Ethiopia Eritrea. Some would say not just the last few years, but the last many years have not been easy. And and some of and those tensions are not just felt here in East Africa, where I'm based. They're also felt in the diaspora where you are. So what has it been like for you as young people to, you know, the last two years to hear of the war, its development, to see Eritrea get involved in the war, to hear of the suffering of our people in different places? What does that feel like to you? And what are the messages that you're getting there in Silver Springs from your community? A lot of the times it's hard to like, as like a discerning like, like reader who like wants to have information that is um, like unbiased, it's very hard to get like clear and like truthful information, I guess, like about what's happening that isn't biased because everyone has their own opinion. I have my own biased opinion. Um, so that's been a little bit hard. Um, especially when it comes to like coming up with opinions like regarding what's happening there. Um, and it's also been a little bit hard when you hear people saying things like that go against your own opinion. And it's important to remember to just be like sensitive when you approach other people that have like different opinions. Definitely. Hmm. Like this, Daniel, do you have thoughts on what has it been like for you in the last couple of years, as especially as the war has ramped up and we've seen... Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, a lot of the news and the and the debates and the discussion has happened in diaspora websites and WhatsApp groups. I mean, it's it's really extensive. Yeah. Um, what has it felt like for you? Um, actually, so my father is he was born and raised in Tigray. So like I've and we have a lot of family there. So I've actually been able to experience firsthand some of the things that have been going on. There have been times where like a lot of our family back in Tigray needed money and they weren't able to receive the money till months, months after it was sent. Um, they cut off like um, trade and stuff like that. And people were like starving. And so, I mean, I've, 
I I definitely have opinions, and I think there were some people on both sides who were very wrong. And um, but I've had this conversation with my dad. Like uh, we'd be sitting during lunch, and we'd just talk, and like you know, time and time again, you sort of see this pattern where like Ethiopia is ready ready for change, and the people are ready for change. They accept a leader, and then all of a sudden everybody has different opinions. And I mean, it's bound to happen because there's so many different ethnic groups and people with who need different things. And so it's hard to meet everyone's needs, especially like if, even if you look at it, there's like what 80 plus languages in Ethiopia. So there's definitely different groups of people who have different needs. But I, the one thing that stuck with me that I spoke with my father about was how that, you know, um, a, per, a good functioning government and society isn't just based on the government. The people also have to mature and be ready to work mm -hmm. together and to like sort of be less selfish and then put the needs of the country first. And so I was thinking that there needs to be more done like when it comes to education and when it comes to um, the government doing things to help build community instead of just trying to give everybody what they need. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that approach should really be uh, given a chance. And that's sort of my take on the political climate in Ethiopia. And Mekris, I want to kind of shape my question for you. And, and actually, before I ask you my specific question, maybe everyone can scoot over just a little bit. I'm I'm cutting off a little bit of Mekris's face. I want to make sure yeah. that we get her fully on there. <laughs> Perfect. Right. That's better. So Mekris, I believe you're, are you the president this year of the of We the East? Yeah. Yes, so maybe, um, you know, that's a big role to have um, and in a year where it's not been easy for the, both Ethiopia, Eritrea, even the Horn of Africa, you know, I'm sure you're all aware of what's happening in Sudan, you know, it's not been an easy year for Kenya. Um, so how does that feel as leading a group of people whose history is not only conflict, we have so much beauty and history and culture, it, we are not just a, a people of conflict, but these years have not been easy. What has that felt like for you? For me, um, well, especially this year with We the East, because I was also president last year, and there was definitely some division within the group, and there was some, um, there was just, I mean, I remember the last dance of the year, people went off and created their own separate groups because they didn't want to work with separate people. So for now, this year, I mean, talking about the group, I wanted to, I honestly did not really address any political things, and Miss Woodward didn't really want myself or the other officers to address political things because we wanted it to be a very safe space. So We the East has not, I, I would say has not stressed me about political things because we don't really mention those a lot. But in my own personal life, honestly, I, I was adopted by white people um, when I was one. So, and then I immediately moved away from Ethiopia and I moved to London and then I moved to Silver Spring. And since then, I honestly have had no connection to Ethiopia. I, I'll send like this annual report to my parents, but I've never actually had a video call with them or sent a letter to them personally. So I actually did not know about what was happening until very late because, and I don't want to blame this on anybody, but when my parents didn't provide me with any information like that, and I wasn't really aware of what was happening in my own culture, so I did feel kind of out of place when I was learning about all of it because I was very shocked. I was like, oh, I did not know that was happening. And I, you know, I don't know what state my own family could be in right now. But um, now that I've done oh. my own research, it's definitely interesting. But it's also harder, like Sophia said, there are definitely a lot of biased articles out there. So when I'm learning only from the internet, not only from the internet, but definitely mostly from the internet, it's still a little bit hard to piece everything together. So, you know, Magdalena, and you telling us kind of about your path, it makes me think about how challenging identity is, identity development, and it does happen over the span of our life. Um, you know, it doesn't end just when you hit 20 or 30 or 40, it continues to evolve. So let me ask you all first, how are you finding your way within your identity? And, and how does being in a maybe Ethiopian and Eritrean community help you with that? Or is it harder I grew up outside of Ethiopian community. I never grew up around Ethiopians. I only saw like my people once a year at this Ethiopian conference. And then I felt all this pressure to like speak Amharic and to know all the customs. But then day to day, I didn't go to high school with Ethiopians. I didn't have anybody in my neighborhood. I was not getting in Jera down the street at the gas station, you know. So I'm curious from your experience, if, if living and growing up in a very diaspora rich environment, how that's shaping your identity. Um, well, for me, I think that um, 
when I was younger, the only like Eritrean influence I had was within my own family um, and like not with my, my friends or anything like that. So I felt like even though I was comfortable and like not knowledgeable of my culture to an extent, I wasn't exactly like given an opportunity to express it very often um, with other people I cared about, like my friends. Um, but when I w went to high school and I found Meet the East and I found like a community of um, people with similar cultures to me, um, particularly when I did the international night dances, I felt like a lot more connected to my culture because going into the experience, I could do like like this, like the simple, like Eritrean dances, like shim shim and stuff like that. But leaving like that experience, um, I was just surrounded by people that were really supportive. They didn't laugh at me or anything like when I was bad at the dances and they made sure that they taught me like, and they taught me like lots of different dances that I had never done before. I learned more about like my culture. So it was just a great overall experience. And I think that like now that I'm like getting older and meeting new people that are also Eritrean, I'm learning more about my culture and in turn learning more about my identity. Hmm. That's so beautiful. I love what you said about them not laughing at you because we need that safety in order to learn. If we don't feel safe, it's actually our brains cannot even make the space to learn, you know. Um, Daniel, what, what about you? Yeah. Um. So again, like you said, we live in a very diaspora rich community and, um, you know, we are very lucky to have that actually. But I want to start off by saying that I don't feel as connected to my culture um as i feel i should be or as as i feel i could be like um i think there's definitely a lot of opportunities to make an effort but i mean when you do your day-to-day -day things and when you hang out with so many different people like the dmv is very diverse like it's people from all over i have like vietnamese friends i have nigerian cameroonian friends and i think that's a really good thing but at the same time i feel like we all sort of have to work with each other um through like a shared medium and that's usually english and like uh, so we'll be taught I'll, I'll only usually speak in English like uh, I'll come home my mom will talk to me in English sometimes and I'm hard sometimes so I feel like I do have to make an effort but I also realize that we're very lucky to live in the DMV and that's because I have cousins in Tennessee for example who would come over and tell me about their experiences like it's it's really crazy how different it is from the DMV um they've told me about like racist experiences they've had um it, it'll just be like blunt racist experiences and then They'll also tell me about how they don't see any Ethiopian people. Um, but, you know, their parents make the effort to sort of keep them in touch with their culture and their roots. And I think that um, for for people who are di diaspora, you have to really make that effort to stay in touch with your roots because it's really easy to lose um, your connections to your past. And I don't think people realize how important it is. Um, so I feel like moving forward, I will make an effort to sort of get in touch with my culture a bit more. I want to follow up on something you said. You said something about, you know, English is the mode of communication. So with mm -hmm. this international group of friends, then you, you tend to speak right. a lot of things, which uh, speak English, which makes sense. Do mm -hmm. you feel pressure or expectation, though, from all the Habesha? Because you cannot walk down the street in Silver Spring and not pass mm -hmm. another Ethiopian, Eritrean, yeah, yeah. Somali, somebody. Somebody's going to be nodding their head at you, Daniel, and expecting mm -hmm. you to agree. Oh, yeah. that. So do you feel that pressure um, to... Um, to Hmm. No, no, I get what you're saying. And um, I mean, I've we, my parents raised me speaking, uh, speaking of Mark, so I'll know like how to hold a basic conversation. So I've never really come up against that pressure. But I've definitely had some friends like, for example, um, uh, one of my friends who goes to Blair, he's he's Ormo. So he only speaks Armenia, right? Um, but he's come. His brother has had to serve people who are um, like who spoke Amharic. And, mm. he, and he, he would tell them he doesn't know Amharic, right? And they would sort of look down on him or they would give him looks or like they would just throw a little shade. And I think that there there definitely is a pressure. Even though I haven't experienced it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't definitely exist. And um, yeah. I mean, I feel like there's better ways to sort of encourage people to stay in touch with their language and like to continue learning or to um, keep speaking Amharic instead of just looking down on them for not being able for to sure. sort of discourage sure. people. So we have to find a better way to encourage people instead of looking down on them. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. And just thinking about what Sophia said too, about that safety. I mean, I yeah. think our culture does that out of a sense of wanting the young people to carry on, you right. know, the oh, culture, no, but you're right. I mean, we experience the same thing as kids and, and I'm much older than you as 30 years mm -hmm. older than you. So that, that kind of breaks my heart to think that it's still happening. Right. You know, and as you, you shared a really vulnerable piece about your story about being adopted and, and you said you sent an you sent an annual report. Is that that's to your biological parents? Yes. Yeah. So, 
this is, I feel like, you know, this conversation is never going to do justice to your story, but if you don't mind sharing, you know, what is that like for you finding your identity, knowing you have biological parents there, adoptive parents here, and you live in a world kind of between, how has that process been for you? Or, or where are you right now, maybe in that, in that process? Okay. Yeah. Right now, um, honestly, if somebody were to ask me what I identify as, I would immediately think African-American over Ethiopian. And it's not to throw any shade. That's just how I grew up because growing up with white parents, I I was, I was felt like I was seen as Black, not Ethiopian. So then I interpreted like black, being a Black American and being an African American. And I grew up kind of in that community. And these last two years, um, you know, after COVID has kind of died down, I've definitely been more aware of the Ethiopian and Eritrean community here. I mean, I walk down the street and people ask me, something in Amharic and then I won't know and they'll be like you don't know it okay. like, oh. yeah. <laughs> and honestly there's some pressure with that I do feel I am a bit insecure about the fact that I don't know Amharic and I remember when I was running for the club I wanted to make it clear to everybody like hey just so you know I don't know Amharic just in case that impacted anybody's views because I mm. do I don't want to feel like I was I don't want them to feel like I was taking a spot from somebody who had much more knowledge and experience about the culture. So I wanted to put that out there. But um, yeah. And was that an issue, Magdalene? Did anyone raise an issue with that? No, nobody had an issue. And a lot of people were like, yeah, I'm still learning my language too. So that was very comforting to know. I thought everybody was going to like attack me. Uh, But that was, yeah. So with the language barrier and like the language part is definitely something I struggle with and also not having any family or honestly close friends that I'm connected to and I don't go to church so I don't I also don't have a church that's you know another um place for me to have a community and connect with people but now I would say yeah my identity is would be African-American but I'm still trying to branch out and create more of an Ethiopian identity with the community here. And you know, honey, that will your whole life, you you do not feel pressure to figure that out by tomorrow or the next day, you know, you have take your time and it's your story, it's your journey. So don't let anybody try and make you rush to figure out or name yourself or, you know, put yourself in a box, honestly, because it does take time and you have to feel like this is who I am, you know, more than what anybody else wants to say you are. Thank you for sharing that. I can imagine that that's not something that's yeah, an easy thing uh, always to talk about. So thinking about your larger Blair community as a microcosm of Silver Spring, which then could maybe be a microcosm of urban America. I don't think it's really a microcosm of the whole of the U.S., but but maybe at least a piece of the urban America. Where do you feel like your community fits in with all those other internationals that you mentioned, Daniel, you know, mm-hmm. with the other immigrant communities or with the non-immigrant communities? Um, you know, mm-hmm. do you feel a solidarity with them? And what is that vibe like on your campus? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, people know an Ethiopian when they see one here, like I, I think they <laughs> definitely do. Um, and it's it's always a positive thing. I mean, I from what I've heard from friends, like people love our food. Um, be, um, people love our culture. They love our people. Like you know, they like how we're so selfless. Um, when it comes to sharing and stuff like that. And so I think people really get along with us as a group. And so, um, I really haven't had any issues with any other groups of people. I actually, we like it's encouraged here at Blair to get along with everybody. And that's one of the things that they sort of um pride themselves in. Like we're probably the most diverse school in Maryland, I believe. Like we mm-hmm. um. We, we have people from all over. And so it's really what makes Blair unique. Like you'll get your academics. You'll, it's a, it has amazing academics, um, amazing extracurricular opportunities. You, make, you meet great people, but at the same time, what makes it different is the fact that you have people who come from Vietnam or Nigeria, or you'll have people who come from, who are born here, or who are just from Silver Spring. And so um, you really learn about perspective, which is important, you know, going into college and then going into the workforce, whatever you end up doing, having that perspective, knowing that people can, are different from you and they haven't grown up in the same way that you have is important yeah. when it comes to working with people. So we really get along with each other here. I don't know if that if that's true for the rest of America, but I, I think at Blair and in most of Silver Spring, we get along pretty well. 
So let's talk about that in turn, the expansion of that to the next generation above you, your parents. Mm-hmm. How do you feel like you're experiencing, and you know, this is to all three of you, this moment in time as members of the diaspora, is it the same as how your parents are experiencing it? Is it different? Do you feel like you can relate to them and their identity as Ethiopians, as Eritreans? You know, Magnus, in your case, I guess it's a little bit different, but you know, where do you see those connections? Where do you see those differences between yourself and your parents' generation around identity? Um, well, my dad, he was um, a freedom fighter in Eritrea, like when he was my age. So he definitely has like, very strong opinions towards everything that happens in the country everything that's happening right now and I think that's why he's a bit like quiet like when it comes to that sort of thing he wants me to come up with my own opinion and not just like listen to everything he says or whatever like my friends are saying and he just tries to give me like I guess an unbiased like path to understand what's happening right now and also like just to understanding myself and my country. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And not all kids get that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a, a chance to kind of figure it out on their own. Okay, how about you, Magras? Do you, when you look at older, maybe Ethiopians, Eritreans that are, you know, you're getting to know, or even a couple of, you know, classes ahead of you at Blair who maybe graduate and come back, do you feel like there's a disconnect or a similarity in how you're experiencing this moment in time? I definitely do think there's a disconnect, but I don't have a very personal experience that I could explain it with. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, from hearing even my friends talk about their parents, I can definitely feel that there's a, at least a slight disconnect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like, could you explain like a disconnect in what ter- in what terms? Like, well, you know, with Sophia, even what you were saying about you know your father as a freedom fighter. So my grandfather was a soldier in Ethiopia. Um, you know, fought under Haile Selassie. So my parents raised me, you know, extremely, you know, with with a very different sense, right? They they immigrated mm-hmm. during communism. Um, we the big famine of eighty five was happening when I was a kid, and so a lot of that trickled down into how they understood Ethiopia, how I understood Ethiopia, and I will say, like, I grew up in a very strict household, you know, and so a lot of what I knew about Ethiopia, I actually credit them a lot. They, I grew up with the beautiful stories of my culture and heritage. Um, and I really didn't know any of the the hard things, I will say, I, you know, I grew up with a lot of beautiful stories. Mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering if you, when you know, when you see the headlines in the news, or you're at dinner, and you're discussing with your family, how you're interpreting the news or events, does that mm-hmm. feel different than how you're hearing your parents or other older people in your community mm-hmm. experiencing it? Oh, um, no, definitely, for sure. I think like, for example, um, I think all of our parents had somewhat of similar experiences. Um, so my dad, he grew up again in Tigray, and um, it was it was during the time where Mengistu uh, Haile Mariam in the Derg regime, <clears throat> they mm-hmm. were like taking young people. A lot of uh, college students were dying; they're being slaughtered. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad got away because of some complications. I can't remember why, but he was just never drafted. But he did experience a lot of his friends dying, and he would just see people being shot in the streets and stuff. And so, um, and my mom, she also grew up during that same time. Uh, her her mother passed when she was very young. So she had to raise her siblings. She had to be an adult when she was barely a teen. So like, you know, um, I think there's a lot of trauma that they have that they like sort of are still fighting. You know, uh, I think we see our parents as these people who are like really experienced and who know everything. But like when you start to grow up and you realize um, they're doing their best to sort of move on from what's happened to them and try and I can see them making the effort to be better to help me be like to make it so that I don't go through the same things that they've gone through um but but at the same time they are human and they do fail and so you can see um some bad behaviors like in parenting that you really can't blame them for because sometimes I mean their parents were the same way too and Mm -hmm. like to be fair they did get treated even worse um, and and um, they've treated me very well. It's not to say that they treated me bad. They're like no, no, I understand. best parents ever. Yeah, best parents ever. But y- you know, there's definitely a reason why there's a disconnect within the community. But I think we're yeah. getting better as the generations yeah. go forward. I think we're starting to heal and understand each other. So that's really powerful what you said about healing and the trauma. Because I think your generation in particular has the language mm-hmm. to talk about. Oh, what you're describing, Abba 
is trauma. That is traumatic right. to experience exactly. that. You know, my parents have a very similar thing, having to raise siblings, have losing their parents very young, but they don't think of it as trauma. It was just no, how life don't. was. Right. But then you look at it, you're like, that's traumatic, but you, your generation up, right? has the language is messed up. So the fact that yeah. you can have compassion for them, I think is really, really beautiful because I think it's what we're going to need in order to understand one another and appreciate what they can teach us and what you can teach us as well. You know, both it goes both ways for sure. So let me ask you just, you know, as you're thinking about the, your futures, you know, wh what feels like home to you when you think about, you know, in the future, you know, maybe one day you'll have a family and you're having, you'll have kids and you think, you know, I want to make sure that they see my home. Right. Where's that place going to be for you? Um, I mean, I can continue. So I, <laughs> I think that, um, in terms of living and, and safety and stuff, I definitely would want to keep my kids here because there's a lot of political unrest, even though as much as I love my country and I'd want to go back and visit and maybe live there temporarily, um, I don't think I'd, I'd, I'd take my kids there. Um, maybe we, we would live in Africa somewhere else <laughs> just like for fun, but I, I don't think I would take my kids back to live there, but it's still home to me. Like I have a lot of family there and I think I will visit as much as I can. Um, but in terms of safety, you know, that's the whole reason why my parents moved here, because I'm sure they would have wanted to stay there if they could. So uh, but at the same time, I still see it as my home and like, you know, going into college. And then um, once I go through like graduate school, like professional school or whatever it is, I definitely want to work and put my efforts into bettering Ethiopia so that you don't have to move in order to have a better life. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's sort of what motivates me into getting my education so that I can use it to um, improve um my country and so make it so that it's it's safe to live there and I mean I, I don't know how that'll be done but I mean we'll, we'll see where it goes but that's sort okay. of how I see it how are you Sophia Mekdas what about the two of you um for me I have a pretty similar response like um this is where I grew up this is where I feel I guess like the most like myself and I want I probably would want to raise my future family somewhere that I feel like familiar with but in an ideal world I would love to like just like like usually I feel like a lot of people like they're raised in their tree and then they come here but I guess like I would love to kind of have like the inverse like like be raised here and then like have my life like I guess in their tree that'd be really nice and like to show like I guess the future gen make sure that my future generation is definitely like proud of their heritage understands like what it means to Eritrea and like the pride that comes with being in Eritrea and I think the best place to do that would be Eritrea but in the United States there are a lot of like there are a lot of communities that will also teach you that here so you know thankfully I have that you have options yeah how about for um, you Magdas for me because I haven't been I have no memory of Ethiopia the last time I was there was like 16 years ago I definitely first priority would be to go there and meet my family and then I would want to experience that you know just being in that area and that community with my actual birth family for a good amount of time and I'm not and since that hasn't happened I'm not 100% sure where I would want to live but I definitely do know no matter who I'm with or who I'm marrying or who I'm having children with I'd want I definitely want them to be in a very um like East African community either I mean, it could be Ethiopia or it could be somewhere in the U.S., but I like I want them to have the experience that I didn't and I want them to grow up knowing about their culture. Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, adding on to that, too, I mean, instead of having to choose between staying here or going there, I mean, we could also really just do our best to develop the communities we've already had here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's like a lot of Ethiopian like restaurants and a lot of Ethiopian people here already. So um, why not just try to develop it as best as we can and then maybe that that'll help preserve as much of our culture as we can, you know, without losing it. Make, make the diaspora, the motherland, huh? Yep. <laughs> it's, not, so it's, not, let, it's not the best thing, but I mean, we can make it work for sure. You, you work with what you have. You're right. Cause not everyone has the, the choice to go back home. That's not always available to everybody. I think we're running out of time. You probably have to, to cut your lunch hour quick here. So mm -hmm. I always ask my guests two questions before they leave. So I'm going to ask you these two quick questions. They were not on the sheet I sent you, but they're okay. very easy. So what's your favorite drink? Hmm. Mango juice, definitely. Mango. Oh, you are definitely East African, my love. <laughs> definitely. That's, 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 I, I, I was going to say uh, orange Fanta, but then 
um she said mango have a shy kid. Have oh my goodness definitely both of them i love mango <laughs> juice too so it's in okay. the blood yeah it's in the blood my goodness how about you i don't know i, I just like fruit things fruit all right fruit i like the theme here the fruit is fruit and orange how about, okay how about you lily <laughs> oh, you know, no one's ever asked me. My favorite, you know, I, oh, yeah, yeah. Let me just go with coffee since we're on the East African that tip works, here. Let me go with my Buddha. Yeah. I can literally wake up and I cannot wait to have my first sip of coffee every day. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. <laughs> And then the last thing to ask you, you know, this show is all, show is all about joy and justice from Africa and the diaspora. That's what we focus on. And today, definitely just talking to you, you've helped us understand a bit more of what it's like to be in the diaspora and, mm -hmm. and to appreciate um, both the connections and, and the gaps that you all are trying to fill. But I ask all my guests this question, and I'd love to hear from you. What is bringing you joy today? Mm. Okay, I have an answer. Um, <laughs> Probably just like in the like so right now we're in AP season and just like right now like just working really hard so that I can like use like all the resources that my parents like tried their best to give me and like make like a successful life and make them proud. That's what's making me really mm -hmm. joyful. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, I mean, yeah, that was a pretty deep question. I, I was just hoping she'd go on longer so I could think. <laughs> but, it can um, be simple. No, yeah, no, but I mean, um, it's good that she brought up the APCs and stuff because, I mean, we just wrapped up like college apps and all that and seeing the hard work pay off. I mean, I, I of course, I, I did like a lot of the schoolwork and stuff, but, you know, it was an investment for my community. People took time to take me places. My parents invested time and money into taking me from places to places and, and encouraging me being there to support me emotionally, mentally. And so, um, you know, seeing all of that pay off and then seeing them happy really does bring me joy and uh, it, it encourages me to keep on going too yes I agree um also with what Sophia was saying about making your parents proud uh, I love it like something I always keep in the back of my mind it's like because I would I was born into poverty and I also have a twin brother who goes here and he and I were both adopted and I just think like my parents they gave away their children to have a better life so I'm just so thankful for the opportunities I have here and I know they definitely do not have those right now and they definitely did not have them 16 years ago so every time I'm if it's an academic challenge or because I do track like an athletic challenge I'm just so thankful that I get to even experience that hmm. The little things bring you joy. That's that's where that's what it's about at the end of the day. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, your insights are well beyond your years. And I can't wait to ask, you know, Marta, where you all are at, because I know you're going to do big things and you make thank us you very, so very, you. very proud. Yeah. Make me very proud. So thank you so much for being on Salam and hello. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, for this opportunity. Such a it was pleasure. Amazing. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Such a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Such and a then, pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thank you so much, listeners, for listening. And a huge thank you to Marta Woodward, my dear friend who made this episode possible. Marta, your commitment to your students, to our people, to our culture is unmatched. And I'm so grateful for your friendship and partnership. Um, and all things salam and hello and in real life as well. And thank you to Magdas and Daniel and Sophia. I am just really moved by your maturity, your kindness, your kindness of heart, and your willingness to share your stories. Our people and our futures are very bright if they are in your hands. Listeners, let us know what you thought. You know, we only had a limited time to do this conversation. The students were on their lunch break, so we had to do it fast. If you'd like to hear more from them or you have a story about your diaspora experience, I would love to hear it. You can reach me on all of our socials, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Salam and Hello. And of course, you can reach me on email, good old-fashioned email, lily at salamandhello.com or producer at salamandhello.com. And please take some time, give a sister five stars, rate and review our show. It would mean a lot. And until we talk next time, take care of yourselves. Peace. Summer in your eyes, I, 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 don't ask me why, I'm by your side, you keep me alive, you keep me alive.